Hey there, welcome to the e-learning champion pod. I'm Shalini, your host for today. And I'm delighted to invite Michael Seelman, CEO of the Leadership Coach Group, a professional certified coach and formal global internal communications chief for the FBI. So Michael has over 20 years of experience and is renowned for his expertise in helping leaders communicate effectively and accelerate organizational change. And uh, having worked with CEOs, government executives and senior leaders globally, uh, Michael has coached over 150 leaders in five continents. And uh, this includes clients at the US Department of Homeland Security, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, to name just a few. And uh, Michael has a very dynamic approach where he blends fun his functional expertise, his leadership insights, and interestingly, improv comedy training. So that makes his coaching and engagements and presentations very powerful and fun. Uh, Michael holds a degree from Harvard University and a CIO certification from the US Department of Defense. And he's currently pursuing his PhD in organizational leadership. So once again, a very warm welcome to you, Michael. We are just delighted that you could join us today. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. So Michael, uh, you have a very fascinating, interesting career profile, and uh, especially the improv comedy bit. <laughs> so uh, would you like to share something about, you know, what, uh, what, um, how did you get into leadership coaching? I mean, what shaped your decisions? Well, throughout my career, and even when I was a early student, like in high school and college, I've been very interested in leadership development. And whether it's my own leadership development or helping others develop their leadership, it's been a passion of mine. In fact, they say my passion in life is helping people and organizations reach their full potential. And so that's been demonstrated and it's been in a variety of different ways. During my career, when I went into supervisory or leadership positions, then I'd have my own team and I'd be really excited about helping them grow their leadership. And I'm also a, a lifelong learner, as they say. So I've been working on right. developing my own study of leadership, whether through my work in my undergraduate or my master's program at Harvard, or now in my PhD and uh, professional development along the way. I'm always trying to improve my own leadership, whether through the practice of leadership or the reflection of leadership. For my coaching, that comes from that passion of helping others develop themselves and reach their full potential. So I, before I even knew the term coaching necessarily, I was helping my own team members do that. And then I decided to uh, shift from being part of my job to being my full-time job to be coaching and now CEO of a coaching company. And I love it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, whereas when I did my government work, I'd be able to have a broad impact to the programs that my team and I worked on, uh, but I didn't necessarily hear back from people directly the impact it would have. With coaching, right at the end of a coaching session, I'll hear, wow, that was so helpful. Thank you. Or, uh, you know, next, hey, I, I did what we discussed and it had this outcome for our company or for my family. And that's very gratifying to hear that kind of uh, instant results. Yeah, sounds sounds great, Michael. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've held leadership roles in the White House as well, right? In addition yes. to the FBI. So, yeah, all that is really very exciting. At the White so, House, um, I led a national gun violence reduction effort where I work with mayors and police chiefs around the United States. Uh, that was very early in my career. So that was an exciting opportunity to uh, grow into that position. Terrific. So, uh, Michael, you were just sharing a little bit about, you know, how through all these years of experience in various capacities doing leadership coaching, you have evolved your own understanding of it. And I'm sure, uh, you know, you have your own understanding of how it should be done, leadership coaching. And so would you like to share something about how it's different from mentoring and counseling? And what is the process? And is there anything, I mean, what is unique? to um, leadership coaching that you don't see in, say, um, management coaching, for instance? 
Yeah, so there's um, some similarities with other modalities of helping people develop their cells professionally, and uh, coaching is one of them. It has some similarities with uh, counseling and mentoring, and they can be very coaching can be very synergistic with those things as well. So many of my clients will have mentors. Many of them might be doing counseling or therapy, uh, so it can be very synergistic with those things. What coaching is focused on is to help leaders have a different perspective on some of the challenges they're, they're facing, to help them uh, look at things from a, from a different way, and to put their insights that they gain into action. And so at the end of a coaching session, we'll ask them, based on the conversation we had today, what commitment will you make to put some things into action? Because that's what we're really focused on. We, we try to bring reflection on the things they've done in the past, but it's with an emphasis to what to do in the future differently. Right, right. So um, I'm sure it's a challenging area, leadership coaching. So um, can you share a little bit about some of the challenges you face and how do you overcome them? For me, it, it seems very intuitive, at least once I had some training. Uh, one of the core skills of being an effective coach is to be good at listening. And um, I think people in the past, like my team members, have told me I was good at listening when I asked them for you know feedback on my supervision or my leadership of the team. So uh, I found that's a very important skill. In coaching, we also practice active listening. So we're trying to reflect back what did we hear the person say and paraphrase that and then the things that they didn't directly say so maybe the emotion emotions that they're uh, feeling and also trying to delve into what's below that surface level that's be very helpful to to bring to the surface to help them explore so that's some of the things that we're trying to do in coaching and we see that our clients are whole people that are creative and resourceful. So it's not like in consulting where we have to bring them the answer and say, here's step one, step two, step three, step four. We might help them develop a plan like that, but it's not like we're going to give them the answer. We listen deeply to try to help them figure out what would be most useful to them in that coaching session and bring that out and then help them um, see that they achieve that insight and then encourage them to take some action on that insight. That active listening is such an important skill for us as coaches and leaders that are coaching their subordinate leaders is that we spent uh, several of our uh, recent meetings as a company focusing on that competency, saying, what was it like when you felt like someone really listened to you? How did that affect you? And then we had a workshop on how do you help others when you practice active listening? Right. Wow. Uh, that's really interesting because, you know, that is a, such a such a fundamental skill to any communication. But I guess the higher up you go, the more critical it becomes. <laughs> it's, it's really critical, yes, in the business world. I, as you mentioned, the going up higher, I think that we, as we grow up the ranks from being a first-line supervisor, a second-line supervisor, and so forth, we then became a leader of leaders. And so to help the leaders that we're responsible for guiding, we want them to be able to do most of the things on their own. And so what I see is we try to be strategic, we try to identify risk, and then we help coach them by putting a spotlight on some areas that we think they should think about, but not necessarily giving them the answers. Because generally the people on the front lines are going to be better at crafting the direct answer. But as a strategic leader, we can help bring their attention to the things that we think from our experience or from what we've heard that they might want to reflect on some more. And so as we go up ranks in an organization, I think coaching becomes more and more a part of our job. Right, right. Which is where I think you've always made it a point to differentiate coaching from training. Yes. I think training has an important role in introducing new concepts and helping people get a 
overview of ways to uh, do new skills, to practice things in a workplace or other aspects of their life, though it doesn't necessarily have an emphasis on taking action. And also training generally tends to be one and done, where you might get enthusiastic about what you've learned, it might seem like you understand it, and my experience is then when you go in to practice it, like, wait a minute, it's a little harder than I thought. You know, the, the theory that I was introduced to, where's my instructor? <laughs> I want to ask some questions right. of. Where are the other people in my class? And uh, they're not there because that's how most training is delivered. Is when you go to a special place, you get introduced to the concepts, then you go back to your business. And then when you're trying to do the hard work of implementing it, you don't have that knowledgeable instructor there on your side trying to help you're you. Right. One of the exciting things about coaching is it's iterative. So you meet with your coach, you talk about a plan you might have, and then you try to you try to implement it. Then you go back to your coach in another meeting and reflect on what happened. And then you can work with that coach on how to adapt your approach based on the new information that you have. Right, right. And yeah, I think uh, leadership training, if done correctly, does give those opportunities for reflection and sharing of insights and uh, the application part, the skill building, which can happen, which can happen provided it's done well, it's you know crafted well, the entire uh, training. But yes, coaching definitely has a, a superior advantage. I think, uh, is it by virtue of it being one-on-one -on -one mainly? Uh, how, how does it typically go? Uh, leadership coaching? Is it a one-on-one -on -one session or do you do one-to-many? Uh, because there are diverse requirements, diverse kinds of uh, leaders that you're coaching. So could you share something about that? Yeah, if I could also uh, elaborate a little bit about training, like you were saying that training can lead to uh, some behavior changes. Jelly is very good at introducing those concepts. Ideally, what I would recommend for companies that invest in the training that's beyond just knowledge building. If you really want, like leadership's a bit more complex and like you want the leaders generally to change behavior. So if you have a team that experiences training together, where they new, learn some new terminology, they have a new frame of reference uh, because they've had that training, if you can then bring it back into the company and in your meetings, purposefully use some of that terminology purposely bring through that some of those concepts that can help increase the impact of that training whereas if you've done it as a group then you'll have that common frame of reference and terminology that you can when you're making a business decision you can say you know what as we learned in our training these are some important right. steps to go through when we're making our business decision then that makes the the trainings much more relevant and can have a greater resonance and impact throughout the business and uh, more uh, staying power of what we've learned. So that's what I would recommend when people do learning uh, through training. And also if the people that went to the training could make a commitment to say, as I went through this training, here's the three key points that I learned and I'm not doing now, that I'm gonna make a commitment to implementing. And ideally, right. as we do in coaching, you make that commitment to your coach and to yourself if they could announce right. it to other people that went through the training or colleagues at work, just human nature is we're much more likely to implement or follow through on commitments if we know someone's right. made a public commitment or someone's going to hold us accountable. Right, right. Yeah, as you said, you know, uh, you're likely to be far more accountable when you're uh, talking to one coach vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, a group and perhaps an instructor who, who you might not see for the next couple of months. So yeah, I, I guess those are some of the things that make coaching really powerful and effective. So uh, Michael, I'm sure, uh, you know, to make the best use of your uh, coaching time, they, they, is there anything that you uh, encourage your um, coaches? Is that the term? Yes, um, um, coaches or client, exactly. Oh <laughs> Yeah, clients. Okay, let's go with clients. So is there something you encourage them to kind of, you know, um, read up on their own or go through some concepts, some foundational knowledge, as you said, you know, leaving the skill part aside. Is there anything that you encourage them to do as some kind of a self-study? 
you know, in their own time at their own pace before they come for your coaching sessions? Yes, there's um, some things that we encourage them to reflect on <clears throat> because we want them to get the greatest return on investment on each and every coaching session. So what I like to say to my clients is think about something that you don't know the answer to and you're struggling with or something you know the answer to but aren't doing. Those two can be great topics for coaching. So the first, like if I'm coaching a CEO, as you mentioned, I'm coaching a lot of CEOs in this point in my career. And there's sometimes things that they don't really know the answer to. They don't, they have some, of course they have some ideas of how to approach it. I was like, okay, bring those challenges to our coaching session and I can be your thought partner in helping work through what would be some options and evaluating those options because it's hard for CEOs, like especially if they're trying to um, have this uh, emphasis with their team members that they've got it and they're they're holding the emotional weight for their team, for their company, because they're at the top. It, it's hard to say, uh, yeah, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> I think it's good to throw things out to your team and get their input, uh, but they can kind of get warmed up by meeting with me or their coach. And uh, so, or sometimes they have very sensitive issues. We've had a lot of social issues in the United States happening, uh, different kinds of protests and things like that, that often CEOs have to work through that they've never encountered before. And they've been asked to kind of go on the record about things, whether employees or external groups. And sometimes they've asked me to go through those things with them. When it's a really safe environment, when someone's not gonna get, uh, you know, overreact to something as they're kind of polishing their language or how they're handling that. So that can be very good things that they might bring to a coaching session. So I encourage them to think about those topics ahead of time. And so they can just really hit the ground running in the coaching session. And then when we have a coaching session, uh, we get through to the end and there might be some things that they made a commitment to and the things they want to work on. And then afterwards, I might send them other references that they can deepen their knowledge about. It could be a training, uh, something that's available online. It could be an article like in Harvard Business Review. It could be a video like of Simon Siddick saying, you know, find your why as a company. You know, so I'll, I'll send them some resources that help deepen their learning or the reflection on the topic we covered. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, there, there are, uh, there's a whole array of digital assets out there which can complement the leadership coaching that you do. Um, so, Michael, I was just wondering: Do you find it, do you find it a very different to coach uh, leaders, you know, from different demographics? You have the younger lot now, you know, um, in leadership positions, uh, many more now as opposed to say a few years in the past. So, uh, how does that influence the way you handle? Um, let's say leaders in different age groups. Is this something no, you consciously try to change or is it something very intuitive that you do as a coach? Well, in any coaching engagement, we try to adapt to the needs of our client and to their preferences because our goals are their goals. We're trying to help them achieve their goals in a way that'll work best for them. And it's, sometimes it's related to age and experience and sometimes it's not. So it depends on the client. What we've encountered sometimes is in the tech area, you have opportunities for young leaders to rise to leadership positions very quickly because they founded a company and um, they often have fantastic ideas. They often have some uh, innate capabilities that are uh, very impressive around leadership and inspiration and also Sometimes they just don't have a lot of experience because of their, they're younger. And they might be sometimes, some of our clients, it's the first company they've ever been in is the one they're the founder and CEO of. And they also only know that stage of development of their company. And if a company is growing very quickly or scaling, as they say in you know, Silicon Valley or things like that, or 10Xing, um, then it can be very challenging for leaders to adapt to change their leadership as a company grows so quickly 
and there are all these right. new challenges come. In a, in a startup company, it's often very fluid, the roles that people have, and, uh, and, then, and their uh, responsibilities often are very broad because there aren't that many people there, but any company has certain functions they need to achieve. So it can be very appropriate in that stage of a company's maturation to have those things. Then when a company is scaling, getting very large, generally you start specializing. People's roles specialize, a hierarchy develops, and that may be very different than that founder or some of the founders have experienced right. because it may be the first company they've ever been in, and they don't necessarily have a mental model of what does a very mature, larger company that is more complex in its structure, what does that look like? What should it look like? I like to look at the example of Google when uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin first founded Google, they were very young and the company grew very fast because they had a very innovative product that was in demand and they were early market leader. And they did a variety of different things to help them uh, scale with their company. And they also did some things where they experimented that didn't work out, but they adjusted. So one of the right. thoughts they had was, gosh, for our engineering team, for a software engineering team, maybe we shouldn't have any hierarchy. We'll just have one engineering leader and all, a whole bunch of engineers in a group. And right. uh, after time, you know what happened is the engineer said, please, we'd like to have a hierarchy because this one guy, poor guy, can't like give us all direction and <laughs> can't wrong. help us all with their professional growth. And, and so they right. experimented with that and they found out, hey, wait, you know, maybe there's a reason why these large companies have supervisory structure and they put that in place. They also brought in uh, Eric Schmidt, who was a more experienced CEO, and uh, he served as a CEO and then he moved on to be chairman of the, the board for them. They kept their co-founder uh, roles, but they realized they wanted some help. Um, I think they brought in some executive coaches as well to help them grow. And that way they were able to stay with the company as it grew to a you know a global powerhouse that it is now. Other executives that found in companies that don't adapt, that don't bring in ex assistance with executive coaching or mentors or other things, they might not be able to scale elastically as quickly as the company grows, and then they might not be able to stay in leadership of that company. So I encourage when you're on a fast track like that, do the things that helped you in schooling or in other parts of your life is learn and adapt and right. ask for help. Right. So, yeah, that's really insightful. Uh, and uh, so leadership styles change depending on your where you are currently and what you are, you know, um, leading. So Absolutely. it's not something fixed, you know, um, not very static. It's something dynamic and evolving constantly. From right. uh, what I gather. There's lots of variables, if you want to think of it as like an algorithm or an equation, is some of the variables might be how large is the team that you're leading. So if you right. can be in one physical location in a relatively small team, you can develop strong interpersonal relationships based on being in the same geographic location. Well, that got a lot more complicated with the pandemic, where we have people that aren't often aren't in the same physical location, at least for every meeting. And so how do you inspire people that aren't right next to you? How do you make yourself accessible to people that can't just walk by your cubicle or walk by your office because they're on the other end of the country in a video conference? And uh, how do you make yourself accessible to them? How do you inspire, inspire them? Or as your company grows and they're in diff different time zones, they're in different countries coming from really different cultures. Uh, so for instance, in the United States, we tend to have what's called a very, uh, a close power distance relationship where we can challenge our bosses where if you go to some right. Asian countries like maybe Japan uh, where right. you're not expected to challenge people in authority and uh, that's a very right. different kind of a culture and you may have employees from that kind of culture you have to well I'd encourage you to adapt your leadership to help bring those folks out and get the input uh, making them feel more comfortable so there's lots of different variables that uh, show up as a challenge when we're leaders, especially as our companies or organizations grow and become more complex and people come from many different cultures or 
men and women sometimes come with different perspectives, people in different cultures, people have different uh, life experiences, and you want to, I'd encourage my clients to bring out that diversity can be wonderful if you're good at facilitating bringing out the value of that diversity. Right. Wow, that that's really a fascinating mix of variables. And I guess that's one of the things that, that makes this uh, always interesting, this area, because you're dealing with individuals from, as you said, you know, across cultures, across different leadership, uh, you know, systems that they themselves were, um, that they themselves uh, kind of went through. So, yeah, I, I'm sure it's a very dynamic, constantly evolving field, and I'm sure it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, and I'm constantly learning from my clients. Like, I'll um, learn from the way they lead, from the perspectives they have, and uh, that'll help enrich the way I can assist other clients. Um, so it's I am constantly learning. And then, as you mentioned, I'm working on my PhD in leadership. So something I'll do is the different leadership concepts or frameworks that I'm learning, I bring into my coaching sessions to help them Sometimes our thoughts might be out there where we're they're a bit free flowing, and then we put it in a diagram or a framework that helps us um, settle in on our understanding of what we're observing, what's happening in our organization. So, I think for my clients that can be very valuable. Uh, to, and we'll draw some diagrams like, you know, here's what's going on in your C-suite team, or let's take a look at your board of directors, or things like that, and and that can be really helpful to have some framework to analyze that. Right, right. So um, your PhD is in the area of psychological safety at work, right? So uh, my uh, PhD programs in organizational leadership and my dissertation that I'm focusing on is how uh, companies bring artificial intelligence into their companies and if psychological safety strategies that leaders would employ could help make those change initiatives more successful. So that's what I'm exploring in my uh, dissertation. Wow, that's that's really a very fascinating topic, and I guess that's something that's on everybody's mind. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, many people are very concerned secretly about AI replacing them, and uh, how do you deal with this whole change that is that is totally? It's been a game changer, really, AI. So I'm sure this this area is really well appreciated and uh, yeah looking forward to um, hearing you maybe uh, talk more about it in our upcoming session in October. Um, so Michael you uh, how do you stay abreast of you know what's happening in this area of leadership coaching how do you incorporate this into your work I'm sure you have your own system which has evolved over time but do you, how do you also keep abreast of, you know, trends and happenings in this domain? So it's how the same way that I would encourage other leaders to do it is there's, there's you know, formal trainings that I can attend that help me with that. There's also things that I read that help me grow. Then there's uh, interactions with my colleagues. For instance, my colleagues in the leadership coach group, they're also very experienced coaches and they're also learning and evolving. And uh, so we have workshops as part of our team meetings where we share what we've learned with one another, we challenge one another. And that's a very important aspect of my own professional development uh, to, to hear those perspectives. And then of course, in having putting things into action, I, as I try different things yes. with my clients and I get after each one of our coaching sessions, we send our clients a feedback form to say, hey, how did it go? Is there anything we could do differently in the future? And uh, seeing what their feedback is, what's very valuable to them, uh, that also helps me grow and develop and be in touch with what they need. And uh, being part of a professional association, these are all the things I encourage my clients to do too. Like for us, we have the International Coaching Federation is our largest uh, association to support coaching. So that's another great resource in our growth. Great. Yeah, I think these um, communities of practice really help in keeping abreast of what's happening out there and what you can 
add to your toolkit, so to speak. Um, can you share, uh, Michael, I was just wondering, since we have a couple of minutes more, would you like to share any interesting war story or some particularly innovative, uh, you know, story of coaching success? Sure. During your vast years of experience. Yeah, I'll share it. You mentioned my improv comedy background. So I'll, oh, yes. I'll share I was hoping that. you would touch on that. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I, I get to use that in my coaching. Like when I, I try to have a variety of different tools that when I see what my clients would benefit from, I'm like, okay, I think this tool might be really helpful. And I had this uh, one client I was coaching and she was a vice president of her company. And uh, I knew she had a sense of humor and she appreciated you know, bringing that into her coaching engagement. I also had been coaching her for a while. So we had high level of trust and uh, you know, right. kind of like a, a friendship. So I, I thought she would be um, ready for me bringing some improv comedy in. So we were uh, starting our coaching session and she was in her uh, corporate headquarters building. And then the fire alarm went off in her building. And she said, oh, Michael, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna have to interrupt her coaching session because the fire alarm's going off. And so she excused herself and she's like, it shouldn't take long, so long. So I stayed on the zoom session and i you know waited for her to come back and i knew she was such a considerate person and so warm and friendly i anticipated that when she came back she might be very apologetic and start with that and i so i, I like thought okay that's kind of like an audience suggestion you know it's like any audience in an improv comedy you get an audience suggestion and you ask for a scene and kind of the scene in my head was like oh it's a fire alarm so this is what happened when she came back on the Zoom session with me. She came back on and I said, oh, hello. And she was apologetic as I expected. I was like, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry. And I said, this is when Zoom was new and you could change, and it was unknown, like it was kind of mode of people, you could change backgrounds and things like that. So um, she's, she's being apologetic. She said, I said, I, I know that if something similar happened to me where I had a fire alarm on my end, you'd be so understanding. So don't worry about it. And I said, wait, what is that? And then I had prepared certain things while she was out in her fire alarm. So I had this image going behind me where there was flames behind me as if <laughs> there was a fire behind me. And then like, there was like alarm going off. <laughs> and then I said, oh, in fact, there's a fire alarm right now. And I'm sure you'd be very understanding about me having to leave because of this fire right behind me that's raging. And she nice. just like, cracked up laughing and just, you know, it was so I brought my improv comedy into that coaching engagement, right. and then it also I wanted to reset her to like kind of let go of feeling bad about the fire alarm being interrupted and helping her um, refocus on her coaching. So that that allowed her to just kind of get over and feel really present, and then have light and loose and being able to dive into her coaching. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. That's really a fun story. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you hear the word leadership coaching, one tends to associate it as a very humorless uh, kind of, you know, coaching. And uh, especially since you said sometimes emotions can run high, you're touching on sensitive topics, you're encouraging people to be more self-aware, which is not always a pleasant discovery for many people. And in the middle of all this, yes. Sure, if you can weave in humor, I'm sure that that's what makes your uh, coaching session stick and effective. <laughs> yes, you know, I, I found that uh, in times when I've been really stressed, I'm thinking about one initiative we were working on at the FBI with our a joint terrorism task force. I was in responsible for a program related to that. And uh, in our preparation for it, something wasn't going exactly right that I was worried about. And my boss had me in with our team and uh, he was assistant director of the FBI and he made a joke and it just brought the tension down and then we were able to problem solve this thing that was really worrying me and we came up with an alternate solution but when I was so tight and so worried about it I wasn't going to be in that creative mood and uh, his humor allowed us to really problem solve it and work it out and then the wow. initiative turned out very well uh, to help you know, protect the country better. 
Uh, but it was his humor at just that right point that unlocked us and then helped us come up with a good solution. He continues to be a mentor of mine today. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I think used correctly, it can really transform the entire experience. Uh, I guess the only um, you know thing one has to be cautious about is when you're dealing with cross-cultural Yes. Uh, in a cross-cultural setting, because humor is always can always be a double-edged sword. You don't know what might be terribly offensive in some other context. But uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea to use improv comedy in leadership coaching. It makes the whole thing seem so much more, um, you know, uh, inclusive, engaging, and it lowers people's defenses enough for them to really focus on what. Uh, they need to be doing in that session. So I think that's wonderful. And um, the skill sets of improv comedy match coaching really well, because when you mm -hmm. step out on stage with your scene partners, you don't know ahead of time what the script is. There is no script. And so you have to be really present with your scene. Right. Partners. And that's the same right. thing. In you want to be really present between the coach and the client really aware of the energy that people bring and right. in in improv comedy when someone proposes something and says hey we're on the moon and let's make some pizzas okay you say great like that my scene partner just came up with an idea of where we are and what we're doing and in coaching right. the same thing is whatever people bring you want to see that as a gift and also for leaders when their people bring feedback to them. I was like, that's a gift. Like, just like an improv comedy. He's like, oh, now I know what to work on, right? It gave me this gift. Right. Uh, I know we're on the moon and we're going to make pizzas. And uh, so that's, there's a lot of things about improv comedy that are similar to the skill sets that are important in coaching. That being pres present, uh, really connecting with your collaborator, your between the coach and the client or the coach and the coachee, as you said, and uh, being open to going wherever is necessary, like not having a fixed idea of where the coaching session should be going, but wherever would be helpful to that client as you co-create, we call it co-create with your client. Right. Where to go. Just like improv comedy folks co-create a scene together and uh, right. for some wonderful outcome in improv comedy is to entertain and draw in your audience in coaching is to help uh, leaders not feel alone if they have a partner and to tackle some of these really important challenges that they're facing. Wow, that's really an interesting parallel. And uh, yes, leadership is sometimes, most times, a very lonely role to take on. So I'm sure these kind of opportunities really help uh, empower leaders to yes. really reach up to their full potential. Yes. So, um, I, yes. Yeah, please go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. Yeah, go. It's, I'm really compassionate towards leaders. You know, they, all the different roles in an organization can be hard at times. And it's important to understand that as a leader. Uh, and who do the leaders turn to? Is that they can have these confidential thought partners and cheerleaders are cheering them on as they continue to grow. And right. you think about if an organization is functioning well, the uh, the challenges that are less complex or less impactful, the leaders should be empowering the people at other levels of the organization to handle those. It's the right. most impactful, most complex, difficult, strategic problems that should be going up to the top. Absolutely. And so how do you help the leaders tackle those? And that's where coaching. Right, right. because the ripple effects are felt all over the organization. So, including, yes, it's a particular including the lives of the people in the organization. I, what I encourage my clients that are the heads of their organizations is you have so much um, influence over the culture, the climate of your organization about like work-life balance, the quality of their experience in that day. It's such a responsibility. Um, and also, uh, you know, sometimes you see your employees or team members at some of the hardest times in their lives when they might be struggling with uh, death in the family or someone that's sick or a uh, challenge with their child. 
So being present in those moments when you might not expect it, uh, to be really compassionate, to live according to your values, that's why I try to help right. leaders to be really responsive. So not only are their lives better, their organization more successful, but all the people, the ripple effect that you talk, all the people that they touch, that they can have happier, more fulfilling lives. So that's what we see when we help those leaders, we can be a force for good and change in the world. Yeah, I'm sure it's highly satisfying and meaningful. Yes. Um, so it's thank you so much, privilege. Michael. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the very best as you continue to influence and touch lives. And uh, Michael, before we wind up, I was just wondering, is there, uh, uh, this is for our dear listeners, we are very excited to have Michael join us for our community of practice event called Learn Flux in October. And uh, Michael, is there anything you'd like to share about your topic for this upcoming l and virtual event? Well, I'm really looking forward to interacting with the audience and learning from them and sharing with them. Uh, I've, I've, community of practices is something that I have a lot of expertise in my earlier career, and I, I love that style of, of learning because it's not like one designated teacher and one designated student is in a community of practice. There's so much each other have to share with one another. So I'm really excited about that format and all the people that I haven't met yet to meeting you interacting with you. I hope you come so we can have that chance. Yes, definitely. Yeah, really looking forward, Michael. And uh, it's very interesting because, you know, we get to hear perspectives from leaders in different domains. And there's a lot of rich cross learning happening. And uh, we really look forward to having uh, leaders like you come in and share your insights and your actionable next steps, which you can share, you know, on various um, in various areas. So once again, thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, I'm sure leaders, our learners have a lot to think about, a lot of food for thought indeed, for those of them inclined to go into this area, this very fascinating, super challenging, yet very fulfilling area of leadership coaching. And uh, yeah, I think uh, since, um, you know, uh, it's not just a one size fits all approach. It's highly customized, highly individualized. And yet there are also some things which are uh, common. You know, the foundation perhaps is something common. And that's where we believe that, you know, uh, something like a blended solution where some of it can be left to the learners to study on their own, coupled with these powerful coaching sessions would really make a great impact and uh, yeah looking forward michael once again to having you and thank you dear listeners for joining us and thank you michael thank you 